from Sam Sonega. Uh, so Sam uh, is broadly interested in the intersection of ecology, evolution, and endocrinology. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth. Um, and so Sam, we're, we're ready to hear your presentation. Okay. Uh, can anybody hear me? Everybody? Yes. I'm just I'm just going to wait uh, just a second until there's a printer uh, going. So. No worries. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, okay, I'll just I'll just start anyway, um, and hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so, yeah, so I'm so I'm thrilled to be presenting. Um, I'm going to be speaking about uh, the gut microbiome. Uh, I had a more fun title like "Go with Your Gut" or "Gut Feeling," but the this is a more accurate title: "Developing a Consensus Profile of Vital Animal Welfare Using Non-Invasive Monitoring." of the gut microbiome and stress physiology and behavior. So just to first give a little bit of background on the gut microbiome uh, and what it correlates with, uh, what I mean by the gut microbiome is the community of trillions of microbes, uh, that's bacteria, archaea, fungi, and viruses present in the digestive tract of animals. Um, and the gut microbiome can interact with the host in a myriad number of ways. Uh, for example, uh, here, when you colonize Japanese flounder with beneficial bacteria, you see increased weight gain, feeding efficiency, and growth. Uh, in black rhinoceroses, uh, breeding success and elevated phytoestrogen production were associated with increased abundance of some rare microbial taxa. Um, probiotic treatment of zebrafish resulted in increased ovarian function, so reproduction can be directly affected. Um, and then lastly down here, this is a really cool one. One study has demonstrated that certain spore-forming bacteria in lab mice produce serotonin transporter proteins um, and actually increase production of endogenous serotonin, uh, which then affects behavior. So taken together, uh, components of the gut microbiome can directly affect host physiology. Um, so just to give you a broad conceptual overview of the, the work I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested in how extrinsic ecological processes like predation risk, uh, which from earlier talks we know, uh, can be expected to have a negative effect on, on uh, affective states and welfare. Uh, so how these ecological processes influence the gut microbiome of wild animals uh, keeping in mind that the gut microbiome is also affected by more predictable effects like seasonal variation, uh, which encapsulates things like food availability, and that can set the envelope within which uh, predation risk effects um, happen. Uh, and I'm interested in the pathways by which the gut microbiome is influenced. So it can be influenced through endocrine function, so stress physiology through cognitive performance, through behavior, uh, for example, a change in uh, feeding behavior, um, and then also uh, obviously an increase in diet. And the more keenly observant among you will notice that all of the arrows in this diagram are bi-directional. Um, so there's a lot of potential feedback loops here. Uh, 
but overall, uh, the, the goal here is to characterize the gut microbiome of mice across different seasons, uh, predictable perturbations, um, and during predation risk exposure, which we might call an unpredictable perturbation. Uh, and then to assess the relationship then between changes to the gut microbiome and changes to physiology and behavior of individuals. Okay. Um, so as you may have gathered, uh, we're answering these questions in the white-footed mouse, Paramiscus leucopus. Uh, this is a, um, a AI-generated Van Gogh <laughs> uh, white-footed mouse. Uh, they're really uh, a really good model organism. They're widely distributed across Eastern North America, really easy to find and trap. Um, and they're especially good for what I'm interested in, because in some habitats, their mortality due to predation is very high. So predators are a big deal for these guys. Um, most of the literature that you see on them, uh, and this isn't relevant to what I'm talking about today, but most of the literature is on uh, uh, Lyme disease. They are one of the primary vectors for Lyme disease. The downside of wild mice is that you have to go out and live trap them. Um, but I've done that, so I have... Uh, um, we, we go out and into the woods, uh, specifically at Norcross Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, we set our traps on six grids, each 50 by 50 meters, and put four speakers uh, on each corner of the grid. Um, on three, uh, we play back innocuous background noise, like songbirds. And then on another three, we do native predator playbacks, like hawks and owls. Um, I do a, a, a fairly good owl impression at this point. Um, and we broadcast calls on a four day on, four day off schedule uh, to prevent potential habituation or a diluted signal of risk. In other words, you, you don't want to uh, deflate the currency. Um, and so we capture mice during this experiment up to four times throughout the experiment. I say up to because it's, it's ecology, the, the mice don't always go in the trap. Um, and at each capture, we are able to collect the following data here. So we have uh, body condition, sex, reproductive status. Uh, we get picoglucocorticoid metabolites from the feces. Um, also from the same fecal sample, we're able to get uh, indices of uh, relative abundance and diversity within the microbiome. Uh, potentially, we're going to be doing some metabolomics. Uh, then at each capture, we also do an open field trial, um, so uh, a test of both fear-like behavior and exploratory behavior. And then my colleague, I'm not going to be talking about this today, but uh, my colleague is also looking at spatial cognition and memory. Um, so just to give you an idea of what the behavioral tests look like, here's a mouse in a personality trial box. Um, so ap after they've acclimated in the trap for a set period, we release them into this arena here for a five-minute behavioral test, which we record. And then you can see we have a tracking software, which allows us to quantitatively measure activity and exploration. Um, and then additionally, we're uh, manually scoring the, the, the trials using the ethogram that you see on the left. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I, I just wanted to mention the statistical approach that I hope to take, um, which uh, is known as a reaction norm approach. Um, so, you know, when you've repeatedly measured individuals over some environmental gradient, uh, you may be interested in how consistent individuals are in the expression of those traits. And so when, you're, when you look at the data this way, you can see the emergence, potential emergence of some, several patterns. You may, may get behavioral types where individuals vary, but they're consistent. Um, individuals may vary and be inconsistent in, in their expression of that uh, behavior or trait over that gradient. And that's what you, know, you might call individual plasticity. Uh, individuals can also vary in their predictability. Uh, and so, mind you, this is all with uh, repeat samples. Um, individuals can vary in their predictability uh, around those, uh, um, those expressions. And then if you're measuring multiple traits, multiple behaviors or, or what have you, uh, you can, uh, of course, correlate them to see how they co-vary uh, and see if what's called a behavioral syndrome emerges. And this is very relevant, I think, to 
to welfare, a lot of what we were talking about earlier today, um, I think this is statistically a good way to look at triangulation. Um, so I only have some preliminary results from a previous experiment here uh, in the microbiome. Uh, so this is what you see across the top is control, predator, and songbird. So control was true control, so just silence in the forest. Uh, predator was the, the owl playbacks. Songbird was innocuous chirping. Um, and then this is, in, uh, in this experiment, samples were only collected before and after. So this is before and after. So we can see that with Shannon diversity, which is a composite measure of both abundance and richness within the microbiome, uh, we see slight differences in both the control and predator groups um, and no, no real difference in the songbird group. Um, an important thing to realize about these data is they, they don't always represent individual level changes. You can see that individual level responses are not always consistent. Um, uh, but in this experiment, uh, only about 25 to 30 percent within each group are repeat samples, again, because it's the wild. Um, and in the experiment that I've done so far, uh, we're trying our best to maximize repeat samples. Um, another great way to look at microbiome data is looking at log fold changes in specific taxonomic groups, uh, which from previous literature, you, we may or may not know something about their functional uh, relevance. Um, so here, just to highlight a couple, uh, the ruminococci here, uh, are a fibrolytic bacteria involved in digestion of plant material uh, in wild animals, and that decreased uh, due to the predation treatment. Um, so this suggests that perhaps part of what is mediating changes to the microbiome in response to risk is a shift in diet. Uh, and then also interestingly, the uh, anaerostypes, uh, they're a butyrate producing bacteria. Uh, you don't have to worry about what butyrates are, but basically they're a uh, product of bacterial fermentation um, and have been proposed as one of the key elements of, uh, of pathogen resistance uh, conferred by gut microbial communities. And the predation risk treatment also decreased that group. Um, so I think when looking at the microbiome, it's, it's important from a welfare perspective to uh, to really examine the, 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 the functional relevance of the groups that are changing. So just to wrap up, um, I think it's possible that the our, the preliminary lack of effect that we that, that we saw with predation risk uh, may have been due to um, high variability um, and potential ceiling effects due to the season. Um, so basically, that the, the the dietary niche during the summer when we sampled them was too narrow to reveal differences due to risk. So maybe not sensitive enough. Um, but that by sampling uh, all of these intrinsic host factors, uh, uh, like glucocorticoids and behavior at the same time, uh, we're, we'll, we'll gain a more detailed picture of, of how this looks and how it can be relevant to welfare-related changes. Um, yeah, so that's all I have. Thanks to the Sheriff Lab and the Gucci Lab and obviously WAI for funding.